Welcome back everyone. My name is Pedron and this is where we do machine learning codes and concepts. Let's get started. All right, module number nine, classification and regression trees. So in this module, I'll talk about decision trees as one of the most interpretable and useful machine learning models, which can be used both for classification and regression. However, a single decision tree might not be the most accurate one. Actually, we're going to call them weak learners. And later on in module 10, we're going to put a bunch of these weak learners together. Uh, basically, we're going to call them ensembling with some techniques like bagging and boosting to make strong learners, right? So it's going to be a forest of trees or thousands of these trees put together to make a stronger learner. And that model is going to become one of the most powerful machine learning models that can be applied to structured data. All right, let's see why decision trees are so simple, useful, and interpretable at the same time, right? So I'm gonna show you a simple classification task. So on the left, for example, we have a data set with two features, X1 and X2, and uh, two labels, right? We have blue label and red label. So in order to give it more context, I can think, for example, X can be your income level, and X2 can be age, and imagine the colors are if you're going to purchase an SUV or not, right? So the blue one is going to be buy SUV. And then so it's going to say purchase or yeah, buy SUV. The red ones are going to be not buying SUV, right? And, and imagine this is the data, right? So the, the, the more income you have, uh, the odds that you're going to purchase an SUV is, let's say, it's larger and the younger you are, let's say you're here, the younger and you don't have money, so you end up not getting an SUV, right? So imagine that's the data. And as you can see, there's this nonlinear relationship in the data, right? And if I want to use any kind of classifier, any kind of linear classifier that we have covered so far, like logistic regression, we can do something like this, right? I can say anything above this, we class blue, anything below it, we class red, right? But we know that that linear uh, model is not going to capture the nonlinearity that we're seeing in the data. And decision trees are perfect for that, right? Because it's going to go ahead, again, this is at the very high level. We're going to look into the details later on. By asking a bunch of yes and no questions, it's going to split the data. That simple, right? So it says that, for example, if your income is greater than S1, so whatever level, we can go to left or right. If it is yes, go to right, right? We go to region one. If it is no, go to left. And then this is our left side. We can go ahead and make another split based on our feature number two, which is age, and say, if your age is greater than S2, yes, go to region two. So this is region two. No, go to region three. This is region three, right? So at the end of the day, we come with three regions and we can label them, right? So easily we can label region one to be blue, region two to be another blue and region three to be red, if that makes sense, right? So as you can see, by asking this bunch of very simple yes and no questions, we, we started from the top of the tree, we went down and then we decided uh, what should be the labels. That That's simple, right? Now I know that if I have a new observation with this, let me actually see if I, yeah, this one, the orange one. If I have a new observation here, what is a class? Red. If I have a new observation here, what is a class? Blue. If I have a new observation here, what is a class? Blue, right? So that, that, that was super simple. Okay, now we're gonna look into the details of all these steps and uh, put it in perspective. So let's see where we are. Decision trees are supervised machine learning algorithm that can be applied to both regression and classification. So we, we already said that decision trees are very simple and uh, straightforward to work with. They are interpretable. They have lots of good characteristics, lots of advantages, like they can handle categorical data very well. You don't need to do pre-process the data. So it has lots of advantages. But at the same time, these models, the decision trees alone, are not that powerful when it comes to the performance, right? Both for classification and regression, usually the performance of a single decision tree is not going to be that satisfying. So for that reason, we're going to work with the variation of decision trees down the road. We're going to basically look at a bunch of those trees together. We're based, uh, make an ensemble method and then to maybe make predictions uh, using those ensemble method is going to do a better job. Okay, we're going to do this in four parts. In part one, we cover some definitions. In part two, we talk about classification and regression trees. 
In part three, we talk about how we can prune a tree and basically what are the parameters and hyperparameters of a decision tree. And finally, in part four, we will talk about pros and cons and why we should go beyond a single decision tree. So this is going to be a very good segue to our module number 10 when we are going to put a bunch of these trees together. Part one, definitions. So what are decision trees? Decision trees are machine learning algorithms that progressively divide data set into smaller data groups based on a descriptive feature, right? So we have a bunch of features, x1, x2, x3. So based on those features, it's going to divide the data set progressively until they reach to sets that are small enough to be described by some label, right? At the end of the day, so that label can be quantitative or qualitative. If it is qualitative, it's decision tree classification. If it is quantitative, it's decision tree regression. We're gonna see much more examples and it should make more sense. Decision trees uh, apply a top-down approach, right? Uh, because we start at the very top of the tree and then you come down. Uh, the, so this is a top-down approach to data, trying to group and label observations that are similar to each other. So these are key terms, right? So basically you wanna label them based on some measure of similarity. So let's look at this very simple example. Imagine we are looking at height versus weight, and there are two classes, male and female. So let's say blue is male and red is female. Basically you want to say, okay, so if I have two features, two descriptive features, namely height and weight, then based on those features, what is going to be the, the outcome of a new person, right? So for example, if we have a new individual in the data set, let's use green. So this new individual you want to see based on these features, height and weight, what is going to be the gender? Is it going to be male or female, right? So remember those two important questions in decision tree models. What feature to start with, where to put the split? I want you to think about this question. So between height and weight, what feature do you think is the better one to start with? Okay, so maybe it's it's better to start with height, right? If you start with height, so you're going to divide the data into two subsets. Let's call them region one and region, for now, let's call it region two, okay? So visually, uh, if you look at region one, maybe you're, we are satisfied, right? So we are satisfied with, with region one because you may think that, okay, look at the number of misclassifications here. It's uh, it's mostly blue, so it, I have a good region you know, that they are, the, they are similar to each other. The observations are similar enough to each other. So may, if you are satisfied with region number one, we're gonna say that, okay, let's keep it that way. For region number two, however, there are lots of misclassifications, right? There is, you know, there are a lot of blues and red. So we need to go down the tree. So this, let's say this way, we need to go down the tree. So what do we do? The, what feature should, again, we have to answer those two questions. What feature to start with, where to put the split? So in region two, it doesn't make sense to start with height anymore because you know height is all around the place in terms of male versus female. But look at weight. If I have something like this, this is going to do a relatively decent job, right? So let's look into that. We're going to divide region, region two in two subgroups. So let's use this split and we're gonna end up with two new regions, right? So basically what are we doing? We're answering these simple questions. If height is larger than six feet, yes, male. So if male, we are in region one. So let me actually. Then if height is less than six feet, or if it is not greater than six, if the answer is no, we go to the left and then we look at the weight. If weight is greater than 180 centimeter, sorry, 180 pounds, then it's male. So we are in region two. So let's call it region two. And then finally, otherwise, we are in region three. So this is region three. Okay. Now, for whatever reason, let's assume that we're, we're satisfied with what we see in terms of purity of the regions. Look at region one, region two, and region three. So we're gonna call it a day say, okay, hey, algorithm, stop here. I'm satisfied with the regions, right? So then we say, okay, now let's assign some numbers, some probabilities in region number, in region, imagine you're going to predict if the outcome is going to be male or female, right? So if the outcome is male, then we can assign some probabilities to this outcome. So what is the probability of male in region one? Whatever it is, so for example, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have nine observations. So 
8 out of 9 is going to be the probability of blue. So this region is going to be blue. We can assign probabilities as well. The same is story for region 2 and region 3. So region 2 is going to be uh, classified as blue, and region 3 is going to be classified as red, which is female. Okay, so we already know them. Blue is male and red is female. Okay, now let's talk about the details, right? So how, how did we decide that this region number one is satisfying? So what would, how can we quantify these decisions, right? So visually it was easy for us, but for the computer and, and let's say if we have the uh, some problem with very high dimension, it's not as a straightforward that we don't have the luxury to visualize it, right? So let's see to what ingredients do we need to understand first. Then the, based on those ingredients, we're going to discuss about the details of decision tree regression and decision tree classification. Decision trees definitions. So when the target variable consists of real numbers, that's going to be a decision tree regression, right? So what are the examples? Imagine your target variable is wage consumption, you know, stock price, stock market returns, you name it, right? These are examples of real numbers. And when the target variable is categorical, you're going to deal with a decision tree classification, okay? So the examples are, the, for example, if you fail to or reject something, right? If you, uh, for example, the target variable can be two classes, default, no default pass, fail, um, accepting a loan, rejecting a loan. Or it can be more than two classes, like say in the stock market, you want to bet on direction, right? So buy, sell, hold, things like that. Uh, so what are the other terminologies? Starting with the top of the tree, we have root node. So here we start a tree by its root node, right? And root node is just the beginning of a tree. Then we start going down the tree. So what is what is the process of a splitting? So a splitting is simply dividing a node into two or more subnodes, right? So here, this is what we call a splitting. Then in order to connect these nodes, we need to use something called branch. So the branch is going to connect these nodes. So we'll connect one node to another. Then the next concept is decision node. Decision node, or we also call it internal node. It is internal node because it's just in, in the middle of the tree. And uh, we are going to make decision in these nodes, right? So we made a decision in root node as well. So for example, if X1 is greater than split one, yes, go to the right, no, go to the left. So this is also a decision node, but because it's at the top of the tree, we call it root node. If it is in the middle of the tree, we call it internal node. But regardless, we are making a decision here. So here's internal node or decision node, decision node, decision node. Then the next one is leaf node or terminal node. So each branch is going to finish at a terminal node, right? So the terminal node is basically the node that uh, it's at the end of the decision tree where it cannot be split into further subnodes, right? So in this example, we are going to have five terminal nodes, okay? And we stop here, for example, because uh, because of a couple of reasons. Maybe we are um, we are adding it. Uh, stopping criteria to the model. We want the model to stop here. We're going to talk about the details later on, or simply maybe there is no enough, not enough observations down the road in this specific uh, part of the data, right? Okay, then the next concept is subtree. Subtree is basically a part of the entire decision tree and which start with a node and end with a terminal node, right? So for example, this is a subtree and this is a subtree. What about this one? So let me just erase this one. What about this one? Is this a soft tree? No, right? Because it's not ending with a terminal node. How about this one? This is going to be a soft tree, right? Okay. Then another concept is called depth of a tree, or we can simply call it level. And that's defined as the, the length of the longest path from, from the root to, to the leaf to a leaf, right? So look at this tree. Where's the longest path from root to leaf? Maybe this one, right? So we go here, we can either go to the left or right. So let's go to the left. So this is the longest pass, path. And what is the uh, level uh, or depth of this path? So as you can see, there is one, two, and three levels. 
So the depth of this tree is going to be uh, uh, three. Then the final concept is uh, pruning. And the pruning basically means that removing a sub node from the tree, right? And we're going to remove a, a sub node of a tree. And if you do that, it's going to remove the leaf as well. We replace everything by a terminal node. So for example, look at this one. Let me use red. Look at this part of the tree. Imagine I want to remove this internal node. If I remove that, so the entire thing, the entire subtree at this region is going to become a terminal node, right? Terminal node or leaf node. So this concept is called uh, pruning. And the idea is applied uh, to, for example, you have a very bushy tree and it's overfitting the data and you want to prune it back. You want to make it less complex. All right, so we're going to talk about all these details later on, but this is just a uh, simple terminology. Okay, decision trees criteria. So at the heart of decision tree algorithm, we are answering two questions. What feature to start with, uh, where to put the split. And in order to answer this question, we have to figure out which split adds the most information gain to the, 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 to the model, right? And by most information gain, we mean, the, you can think of it as maximum purity, which split is going to generate the maximum purity among the classes or minimum impurity. These are all alternative terms that we can use, right? So let's look at an example. So this is a very balanced, exaggerated example. We have 20 observations, 10 of them are blue, 10 of them are uh, red. Let's say we have two features, X1 and X2, and it's very, very balanced, right? So let's, let's look at some splits. So if you look at this data set, uh, most probably it is obvious that which one is a better split, what feature to start with, but let's, let's just for fun, let's look at an exercise. So imagine we start with this split, right? So we're starting with feature number one and put the split here. Do you think that it's a good split? Well, actually it's going to be one of the worst one, right? Because why? You can see the maximum impurity here. We have region one, region two. Do you see the maximum impurity? We wanted to minimize the impurity, not maximize it, right? So this is not going to work. What about this split? Well, this is what is going to be actually the perfect answer here, right? Because what is purity here? 100%. What is purity here? 100%. So the impurity is zero if I use this split, right? So how can we quantify these things? In order to quantify this uh, level of satisfaction, let's say impurity, impurity, and etc., we need to do, do look at uh, some statistics, right? If we are dealing with a regression model, we look at our old friend MSE, this is mean squared error. We can also look at RSS, residual sum square. So basically a split is a good split if it is reducing the MSE or reducing the RSS more, right? So the, for regression, it's very straightforward. For classification, uh, however, we are going to work with more than one statistic, so more than one measure. Uh, we are going to work with the error rate, entropy and gene index. So error rate is something that we're all familiar with, the number of misclassifications. So for example, here, if I, if I use a split green, what is the error rate here? 50%. What is the error rate here? 50%. If I use the red split, what is the error rate here? Zero. What is the error rate here? Zero. So you already know that you want to minimize this the error rate, right? For entropy and Gini, the story is the same. These are some measures that control how a decision tree decides to split the data, right? And all of them are measure of impurity. I'm gonna talk about the details of entropy and Gini index, but remember, uh, we, are, we wanna minimize these things. We wanna minimize error rate, we wanna minimize entropy or Gini index. And down the road, you, you will see that these ent uh, entropy and Gini index are going to be a better measure, a better measure compared to error rate. And from now, from now on, we're going to work with either entropy or gene index. In the next slide, I'm going to explain why. So what is entropy? What is gene index? Uh, we know that they are both measure of impurity, right? But let's see what is the difference between the two. Entropy is going to measure the impurity or randomness or uncertainty in the data points, right? So for example, in the previous one, if we use the green split, the uncertainty is going to be larger, right? The, the randomness is going to be higher. The impurity is going to be higher. Gini index, on the other hand, measures how often a randomly chosen element would be incorrectly labeled, right? 
Again, in the previous example, if you use the green split, uh, the answer is 50%, right? You know, how often a randomly chosen element would be incorrectly labeled. Okay. So in either case, we know that a number closer to zero is better. Why? Because zero express all the elements belong to a, spe a specified class, to a pure class. So we like these metrics, the entropy gene index, to be as close as possible to zero, because that's a sign that you're uh, getting a more pure classes. And so in the previous example, if you use the red split, the, both the entropy and gene were zero. Okay. So let's look at the uh, formula for either of them. And uh, later on in the course, I'm going to work with the numerical example and cover you know, all the combinations uh, of how we can calculate entropy and genie, at least for once. And then the, afterward, we're going to just trust computer and the computer is going to do the calculation for us, right? So what is entropy? Entropy is a function of the p, this is probability of each class, multiply log of p, right? And we add over all the classes that are available. So, and so this is, I want you to just focus on the big picture. And genie is simply equal to one minus the probability of classes to the power of two and then adding them together. So in either case, look at that. If the probability of a class is close to one, if the class is pure, what will happen to entropy? So look at that here. We plug one and we plug the log of the, the one. What is log of one? It's going to be zero to add any base, right? So one multiplied zero, zero. What about this one? The probability of each class, if the class is one, so one to the power of two is one, one minus one, zero. So as you can see, if the, pro if the class is pure, uh, both entropy and gini are going to go toward uh, zero. If the class is 100% impure, so if the probability, for example, goes to zero, the same story. Both, if you do the math, both the entropy and Gini are going to go towards zero, okay? So let me give you an example uh, that hopefully is going to shed light in terms of how to distinguish uh, entropy, how, how actually calculate entropy and Gini index. Imagine you're flipping a coin, right? And you're flipping a fair coin. That means that the probability of tail is going to be equal to the probability of uh, head is going to 50%. Where do you, when do you get the maximum uncertainty when you're flipping a coin? You get the maximum uncertainty if the coin is a fair coin, right? Basically, if the probability is 50%. So if the probability is 50%, then you get the max uncertainty. You, you get the max amount for entropy, you max amount for Gini index the max amount for misclassification, right, the, or the error rate. So basically, in this simple example, if probability is 50%, we're here, we get the maximum value for entropy, genie, and misclassification error, right? So this gray curve is what we call a Shannon entropy. The Shannon entropy in the formula is going to use log to the base of 2, okay? So if you do the math, when you, when you uh, just replace 0.5 log of 0.5 plus 0.5 log of 0.5, you're going to get uh, minus 0.5 plus minus 0.5, so minus 1, multiply minus, you're going to get 1, right? But however, for other metrics, for Gini, you're going to get uh, 0.5 if you just plug the probability is 0.5 here, so 1 minus 0.5 to the power of 2 plus 0.5 to the power of 2. So you get basically 0.5. Okay. So for misclassification, the same story. Uh, what is the probability of making the error? So it's going to be 50% if you are flipping a coin, right? So, uh, so that's why we're, we are going to report this number as 0.5, and we're going to work with a scaled version of Shannon entropy. So this is the Shannon entropy when the, the log is in base 2. If we just transform the log to base natural log, we're going to scale it from 1 to 0.5 for the maximum uncertainty, right? So this is now we can compare these uh, uh, impurity measures a lot easier, right? I can compare, and by the way, we call this cross entropy. Cross entropy. So I can compare cross entropy, Gini, and misclassification error a lot easier. So I, now I want you to focus on the bottom part of this chart and look at that. 
when the classes are pure or impure, which one is more sensitive to yeah, basically changes in probabilities or more sensitive to purities? Look at that. It seems to me that the red curve is more sensitive than the green one, and that's more sensitive to the blue one. So entropy is going to be more sensitive than Gini, and Gini is going to be more sensitive that, than error rate. In practice, entropy and Gini are very close, you know, they are very close to each other, and that's why we usually prefer them to misclassification error. Okay, so that's all we needed in terms of basic terminologies to be able to understand decision tree models down the road. Part two, classification and regression trees. Starting with regression trees. So we're gonna work on an example, which is called baseball salary. And I borrowed this example from Introduction to Statistical Learning in R textbook. So this is a main textbook for uh, a lot, many the introductory level courses in machine learning. Uh, so in this example, the baseball salary is color coded. Okay, and from low, basically blue greenish dots to high yellow and red. So look at that, we have two features, x1, x2. And guys, remember, this is regression. So it means that the target variable is continuous, right? And the, that target variable is baseball salary. In order to visualize it better, we're gonna color, use colors to look at the quantities uh, for baseball salary. So blue greenish ones are the lower salaries and the yellow reddish ones are higher salaries, right? So with that in mind, let's uh, let's see if you can build the decision tree regressor here. So as a reminder, what are decision trees? Decision trees apply a top-down approach to the data, trying to group and label observations that are similar. So the key term is that this the, basically you're going to uh, label the data based on their similarities, right? Okay. So the main questions in every decision-making process in the decision tree is what are what? Number one which feature to start with number two where to put the split where's the cutoff point i want you to pause the video and stare at this data set at this graph here and uh, think about what feature should you start with should you start with years or the number of hits okay so maybe you say okay it seems that if i start with the number of hits it really doesn't matter where i put the split if I put the split here or here or here, it seems that the colors are all around the place. So maybe hit is not the best, number, the best, best feature to start with. So maybe you say, okay, let's start with years, right? If you want to start with years, so let's say, okay, years is going to be a better feature to start with. Where do you put the split? Maybe around five, right? Four something, five. So anything to the left, again, you're visually satisfied, but we know that what is decision uh, three criterion for regression, right? If you watch the previous video, we look at MSE or RSS. And then we calculate the RSS after each split and we add them together, we compare those numbers, right? So it seems that here the dots are more similar to each other. So maybe, maybe we are satisfied with uh, region number one. What about region number two? Not necessarily, right? Because there are blues down here and reddish ones up there. So maybe we need to do further splitting, right? Then I want you to focus on region number two and uh, tell me what feature should we start with, years or hits? There you go, hits, right? So where you put the split, maybe somewhere around 100. Now you can say that, okay, it seems that observations in region three are more or less close to each other in terms of color, region number two and region number one. We can go further down the tree, but just for the sake of argument, let's stop here and then to, uh, try to interpret that, right? So, and this is what we're gonna do. But before interpreting things, let's talk about the prediction of the model. Uh, guys, remember, uh, we have the, well, the decision tree regression divided the data, uh, the entire train set into three parts, right? So R1, R2, R3. In each part, there are some, the values for baseball salary and we know that they are more or less closer to each other right so we can take the average of all those values let's call them y bar one and then this is the average for y bar two and this is the average for y bar three so at the end of the day this decision tree model is going to give you three numbers so let's say you started with a three and then 
maybe we ended up with three numbers, right? So this is maybe y bar one, y bar two, y bar three. So this is a regression model. It means that if you to, if you want to tr try to predict uh, uh, a baseball salary for a, an observation in a test set, let's use purple. If your player is here with these uh, amounts of years of experience and number of hits, then your model is going to predict the salary is going to be y bar three. If it is here, the model is going to predict the average salary is going to be y bar two and etc. Okay, so the predictions are going to be the three numbers here actually, only three numbers for prediction if we stop the tree here. Okay, now let's look at the, look into the interpretation. Okay, interpreting the results. So based on color coded salary, it seems that years is the most important factor in determining salary. So we started with years, right? It was most important because it, we, we were satisfied visually for now uh, with, the, with the split, right? With the, the colors, homogeneity of the colors. Later on, we're going to talk about you know, how we can quantify them. For less experienced players, so if you're in the left-hand side, for less experienced player, the number of hits seems irrelevant. It really doesn't matter if you're hitting 150 or you're hitting 50. So there, it seems that the baseball salary, look at the colors, are very close to each other. However, among more experienced players, so if you are to the right side of this cut, uh, the players with more hits tend to have higher salaries, right? So look at that. If you're on the right side of this split, this cutoff, it seems that the one that have higher fit, hits numbers are uh, getting more salaries compared to the one with lower number of hits, right? And it makes intuitively sense, right? So. And as you can see, the, the model is very easy to display and also easy to interpret and explain. So this is a big advantage of decision tree models. They are very, very interpretable and we like that interpretability. So let's talk about the tree building process. So the steps are like this. Divide the feature space into J distinct and non overlapping regions. So remember, we started with making the first split. We have region one, region two. They were non overlapping, right? And then we ended up with three regions in that example. For every observation that fall into region RJ, we make the same prediction, which is simply the average of the target variable, target values, right, for the train observation. So let's look at that. So imagine uh, we have region one, two, three, and the prediction for region three, let's call it y hat in region three, is going to be one number, the average values for region three. Predictions for y hat region two is going to be one number, and etc. Y hat r one is going to be y bar one. Okay. We are going to end up with three numbers. The goal is to find the region such that the, the RFS is minimized, right? The residual sum of the square. How do we calculate the residual sum of the square? In regression, it's very straightforward, right? Basically, find the residuals and square them. Y minus y hat, right? So y minus y hat to the power of two for each region, and we sum over the regions. Okay. So for uh, region number one, we come up with RSS one. Region number three, RSS three, and region number two, RSS two. Right. So if um, if down the process we are here, we can calculate the summation of these RSS. Right. RSS. Let's say the J goes from one to three in this example, right? Uh, so at each point at the tree, we're going to calculate. So based on the number of the splits that we have, we're going to calculate this summation, right? And we're going to continue the process of cutting or making splits down the road, down the tree, as long as this summation is being reduced, right? So remember, you start with no split. If this is the entire data set, there's no split. You have RSS, residual sum of square. Basically, that's the deviations from the average, right? So that's residual sum of square, the average model. Basically, the RSS is going to be max. Then you make the first split. So you have one RSS here, one RSS there. You add them together. If this summation is smaller than the previous RSS, you say, okay, I accept this split. I go down the tree. And then down the road, you make another split. If the, if the new summation, let's call it RSS three, if the new summation of RSS one through three 
this is smaller than the previous summation, you're going to say, okay, accept this the, uh, the split and continue, right? So we're going to go down the tree as long as this RSS is going to be the reduced, right? Uh, if you look at the train set, that's going to be, to be the case always, right? So intuitively think about it. Uh, if you simply just divide the data into more subspaces, the RSS is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller in the, in the train set. So we know that if you don't put a stopping criteria for a decision tree, it's going to overfeed at the end of the day. And we can make this you know, RSS, basically the summation equal to zero. If you make a very bushy tree and at the end of the day, each observation is going to be end up at a one terminal node. So there's going to be no error, right? So the predicted value is going to be exact number that we see. So, so we, we already know that there's no points of tuning the, 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 the model by looking at the train set. So that's why we have to look at the test set and make a decision that should we go down the tree or not. Now let's see how we formally define this uh, tree building process. Okay, How does the algorithm select the feature xj and split uh, the, the cutoff s? Okay, So the idea is very simple. We know that it is computationally the almost infeasible to consider every possible partition of the feature space into J boxes. So for that reason, we're going to take a top-down greedy approach that is also known as recursive binary splitting. Right? So it is top-down because it begins at the top of the tree and then successively, sequentially split the predictor space, right? the feature space. And each split is indicated by two new branches further down on the tree, right? So that's why we call it its top-down. It is greedy because at each step of the tree building process, the best split is made at that particular step. Without, well, instead of looking ahead and picking a split that will lead to a better tree maybe down the road, right? So, so let, let, let's see the, yeah, how we can write it down. Uh, X, J, and S are selected such that splitting the feature space into region, let's say R, you know, R, J, R1, and R2, leads to the largest possible reduction in RSS. So this is what we discussed in the previous slide. So we are going to find these two parameters, you know, X, J, well, X, J, what feature to start with, where to put the split, by looking at which cutoff, which split, is going to reduce the RSS most, right? So here, let's say for the first cutoff, we have two regions, you know, region one, region two. Then we can calculate where, where should we put this exact cutoff by going over this optimization problem, right? So in region one, we're gonna calculate the RSS. In region two, we're going to calculate the RSS. So we end up with RSS1, RSS2. Then we try to minimize that, right? So we're going to change the cutoff. For example, we can move it from left to right and recalculate a new RSS1 and RSS2. And we'll see which one is larger, right? And we're going to pick this smaller one. So it, in this case, it seems that based on the color-coded uh, observations here, it seems that the, uh, the blue one, so the RSS1 plus RSS2, is going to be way smaller than the red ones, RSS1 plus RSS2. Here. So again, in this uh, simple example, it seems that this is a better cutoff compared to this, right? So this is going to be done iteratively and uh, the algorithm is going to be able to uh, optimize basically what feature to start with and where to put the split, basically J and S. And we said that the this recursive binary splitting is greedy because it doesn't look ahead and it doesn't look, uh, the, look at the potential good splits down the road, right? So the best split is made at that particular step rather than looking ahead and picking a split that will lead to a better tree in some future step. So this is a caveat. This is a caveat of this model and we are going to fix that one. Okay, we found the first split and then what? Then the algorithm repeats the process looking for the best features and a split in order to split the data further. And it does that to minimize the RSS within each of the resulting regions. Remember, the goal is to minimize the summation of those RSS, right? 
The process continues until a stopping criterion is reached. Because without a stopping criterion, the model is going to overfit, right? It's going to go down the tree in the train set, and we know that the RSS is going to reduce, right? So we have to put a stopping criteria. And for instance, that stopping criteria can be, okay, continue until no region contains more than a fixed number of observation, or continue to this level of the tree, to this number of depth, right? So in our previous example, let's say we have a stopping criteria, and that's going to be level is equal to two, right? So stop that when the level is two, do not uh, split the data further. If that's the case, so here what we have. So we have uh, the first feature to start with was years. If the year is less than 4.5, if yes, we go to the left. So yes, here, we take the average of these observations. The average is 5.11, and we report this number as a prediction for every test set that we're going to see, we're going to predict here, right? So if you throw a test set into this decision tree, any the observation in the test set that has the years less than 4.5 is going to be uh, the baseball salary is going to be assigned to 5.11. If so, no goes to the right. Then if no, we need to make another split. Another split is based on number of hits. If number of hits is less than 117, so we are here. So we'll take the average of these numbers. So average is 6. So report this number for the prediction for all the new uh, observations that you want to pr make prediction for. And then if no, we are here. Take the average of all these dots, it's going to be 6.74. And that's the predicted value for the test set in this region, let's say this, this one. All right. So now let's look at the five region example of recursive binary splitting. So, so the idea is that, uh, you know, depending on what's the stopping criteria, we can come up with more uh, uh, values for predictions, right? Do more terminal nodes. So in this example, let's say we have x1 and x2, and these are the cuts. So starting from, let's say this is cut number one, cut number two, number three, and then number four. And this is a decision tree related to that, corresponding to that uh, box. So, and we are going to end up with five regions, right? So R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. We can visualize it in a 3D graph as well. So let's say we have x1 and x2 as features, and this is our uh, target variable, and these are the level of predictions, right? So for example, let's actually go down uh, the tree on one of these paths. So let's say if we can, if we can find region four uh, in this 3D graph. Starting from the top of the tree, right? Is X1 less than T1? So the yes goes to left, no goes to right, right? So where's T1? This is T1. Is it less than T1? So the answer is no, so let's go to the right. Is it less than T2? So here is the value for, let's say, T2. Yeah, sorry, T, is it T, this is T3, yeah. Less than T3? Well, no. Then is it, then we look at, so basically we are here, we are here now. Then the next cutoff is going to be, is X2 less than T4? So if the answer is yes, we are in R5, sorry, if, if the answer is yes, we are in R4, if the answer is no, we are in R5, right? So if you want to show it in this, show it in this 3D plot, this is going to be our R4. R4. Okay, and then this, this number here is going to be the cutoff for our T4. Okay, so as an exercise, I want you to try to label all these uh, numbers here. Okay, these are the average numbers. So we're going to get how many? Uh, one, two, three, four, five predictions for the um, for the model. Okay. We're almost done with the discussion of regression trees, but before going over classification tree details, I want to talk about uh, the concepts of why decision trees in general are susceptible to overfitting in the train set, right? So let's look at the RSS in decision tree if there is no stopping criteria. So if there is no stopping criteria, 
this we can basically make this tree very bushy so let's say it's it's a super bushy tree and at the end of the day imagine at each terminal node there's only one observation right if there's only one observation at each terminal node so what is the prediction the prediction is going to be equal to the value of that observation so what do you think at each region at each terminal node what is rss zero right because there's no error so if you sum over all these RSS over the regions, over all the terminal nodes, so what do we get? Zero. So as you can see, if we do not put any stopping criteria, this RSS can be exactly equal to zero. However, if you compare this one with a linear regression model, let's say a very basic model is here. We have two features, x1 and x2. So let's write it down like this. There's a bias term plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus some error term, right? Then, so how does it look like? Maybe it's a hyperplane surface like this, right? Something like this, and this is going to be the predictions, right? So as you can see by construction, this linear regression model, the, the R says, can, maybe it can converge towards zero, but it's never zero, right? So in general, linear regression models are going to be less prone to overfitting compared to classification to, to decision tree regression, right? So we have to be careful when it comes to tuning the hyperparameters. We need to make sure that we put a stopping criteria for decision trees. Otherwise, it's going to overfit. Now let's talk about classification trees. So we started this lecture by going over an example for classification, and we're going to stick to the same example. So we should be pretty much familiar with this graph here and the corresponding tree. Okay. So classification trees are very similar to regression trees, except that it is used to predict the qualitative response variable rather than a quantitative one. The other difference is that the decision tree criterion is different. For regression, we use RSS or MSE. For classification, we know that we are going to use entropy or Gini. Okay. And so the predictions of the algorithm at each terminal node would be the category with the maximum the majority vote, right? So, or most commonly occurring classes. We, we saw the example that we are going to assign probabilities and we say that, okay, in region one, the class is going to take the highest probability or the majority vote. So R1 is going to be blue. We call the blues males and et cetera. R2, again, male, R3, female. All right. Now let's see how can we calculate this decision tree criteria, this impurity measures. In part 28, I talked about the concept of the Gini, Shannon entropy, classification error rate in more details. But I promise you that we're going to go over a numerical example uh, to calculate the numbers. So let's go over that numerical example here. Okay. So we already know that um, classification error rate is not as sensitive to impurity compared to cross entropy and Gini, and we saw it by looking at this graph. Okay, so we said, okay, so it seems that entropy here, this is cross entropy, a scale version of Shannon entropy, is more sensitive to Gini, and Gini is more sensitive to uh, misclassification error. Okay, and here are the formulas for them. So class uh, classification error rate, so this is nothing new. We have seen that it's one minus accuracy. Okay. Then uh, for Gini index, uh, we, we looked at this formula, the other version of that, but this is pretty much the same. It's probability of, uh, uh, let's say probability of MK multiply one minus probability of MK. What is probability of MK? That's represent the proportion of the training observations in the mth region from the case class. And then finally, cross entropy is the natural log version of the Shannon entropy, right? So Shannon entropy, this log is to the base of two, but cross entropy is to the base of uh, E. Okay, so I think going over a numerical example is going to be a lot easier to follow this notation. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's look at that numerical example. So here is our simple example. Imagine there are two features, X1, X2, and we have two classes. There, there's going to be 10 red circles and 20 blue circles. Okay. We're going to calculate the Gini index, cross entropy, and error rate before making any split and, and after making a couple of splits and comparing these numbers. So let's start with the 
case that the entire training data set is used before making any split. Okay, so let's look at this one. This is the entire train set before any split. Let's calculate the error rate, the cross entropy, and Gini. Starting with the, uh, let's start with the, well, actually, let's do some, the, calculate some probabilities first. So in this example, in this box here, what is the probability of blue? We have 20 blue and 10 red. So it's going to be 20 divided by 30. What is the probability of red? It's going to be 10 divided by 30. So with that, let's calculate these in measures. Okay, starting with Gini, maybe. So starting with Gini, it's one minus the summation of those probabilities to the power of two. So one minus 10 third, 10, uh, one third to the power of two plus two third to the power of two. We're gonna come up with this number, 0.44. For cross entropy, minus the summation of P log of P, right? So again, when the class is uh, uh, red, red versus when the class is blue, the probability. So 10 third log of 10 third plus 20, uh, when I say 10 third, I mean 10 over 30, right? One third and two third log of two third. Okay, so if we add these up and multiply it to minus one, we get this number 0.64. And finally, the error rate is one max the probabilities, uh, one minus max of probability. So one minus the maximum of 10, 30th, and 20, 30th. So we get 0.33. I think we don't need to necessarily think complicatedly about this error rate. Look at that. So if you're classifying the class to be, I don't know, blue, what is the error rate? It's going to be one third. Okay. All right. Now let's make a split. The first split is going to be if uh, the first feature to start, with, let's say just for the sake of argument is X1 and the cutoff is S. Okay. So here's our cutoff point and uh, we are starting with X1. So we will end up with two regions. So region number one, region number two. Okay. At each region, we can calculate probabilities. So in region number two, we're going to have nine blue and one red. In region number one, we're going to have 11 blues and nine reds. Okay. So what are the probabilities? The probability for blue in region one is going to be, uh, let me use, yeah, probability of blue in region one. This is our MK, right? P of MK, uh, P hat of MK is going to be called 11 by 20 and probability of red in region one is going to be called to nine over 20. On the right hand side, the probability of Blue in region two is going to be nine tenths, and the probability of red in region two is going to be one tenth. Now, with these four numbers, we're going to calculate the Gini entropy and error rate. So, starting with Gini again, and so let, let me calculate one more thing. So, overall, what is the probability of region one? So, how many observations we have? We have twenty observations, right? And out of, so here we have 10 observations. So 20 out of 30, so two thirds, there's two third probability of region one and one third probability of region two. Okay. So two third, look at the Gini, two thirds for region one, one third for region two. So two third you know, multiply one minus what? Uh, so we have, what are the probabilities in region one? Uh, there are nine twentieth and 11 twentieth, right? So 9 20th for red, 11 20th for blue. 1 10th in the region 2, 1 10th for red, 9 10th for blue. So if you do the math, you're going to see the number is going to be, the Gini for, with this split is going to be 0.39. We can calculate the cross entropy for this split. Exactly the same story. 2 third probability of region 1, 1 third probability of region 2. And within each uh, region, we can do deal with the, their own probabilities. So if you do the math, we're going to get 0.57. And same story for uh, misclassification error rate. Two thirds multiply 9 20th and one third multiply 1 10th. So we're going to come up with 0.333. Okay. So now I want you to compare these numbers. When we go from no split to let's say split number one. Okay, split one. This is one choice, right? And 
look at that. The genie goes from 0.44 to 0.39. The cross entropy goes for 0.64 to 0.57. And the error rate goes for uh, goes from 0.333 to 0.333. So not surprisingly, it seems that error rate is not that sensitive to change, right? Impurities, right? So for that reason, we're gonna no most of the time in practice, we're gonna skip this error rate. Okay? However, when you look at G and entropy, so it seems that there's a, a good amount of reduction in uh, in the, the impurity measures, right? So for Gini, we go from 44% to 39%. So there's 6% decrease here, here 5% decrease here, right? For the cross entropy, we go from 0.64 to 0.57. So there's 0.7 decrease. Okay. So which one is more sensitive? Cross entropy is more sensitive, right? Now let's look at another split. So I leave this one as an exercise. So I want you to go ahead and do the same same thing like what I did. You know, define them like R1, R2. Write down the probabilities of blue and red. Write down the probabilities of region one versus region two, and try to calculate these numbers. So just confirm these uh, these splits, right? We're gonna end up with this split. Uh, well, this number for Gini, this number for uh, cross entropy and this number for error error rate okay now let's say we have a split number one and split number two so this is a split number two split number one is that starting with x1 and putting the cutoff point as s split number two start with x2 and put the cutoff point for s right then you want to see which one is reducing, which one is giving you the most information gain, which one is reducing the impurity measure most, right? So we have to calculate two other numbers. This one goes from 0.44 to 0.37. So what do we get? We get 0.07. And what is the difference between these two? Going from 0.64 to 0.54, so it's 0.10. And then this one goes from 0.333 to 0.3. So we are going to end up with 0.33. Okay. So which one is the winner? Uh, well, again, cross entropy is going to be more, more uh, sensitive to impurity. But between split one and split two, which one is the winner? The one that reduced the impurity measures more, right? So the answer is split number two. Why? Because this is the amount of information gain uh, for Gini, which is higher than five. For cross entropy, it's 10% versus 7%. And uh, for uh, error rate is this number versus almost zero, right? So overall, the winner, so what is the takeaway from this slide? The winner between split one and two is going to be split two. And cross entropy is going to be the most sensitive measure to impurity index. So cross entropy is more sensitive than Gini, and then we are not going to deal with classification, misclassification error. All right, now let's discuss the difference between a decision tree model and a linear model. So we already discussed this uh, decision trees versus uh, simple linear models in regression analysis. Now let's have the same uh, discussion for the classification. Okay. So on the left, we are looking at linear model. So on the left, these are linear models. And on the right, these are tree-based models. If you look at the decision boundary, so it's straightforward that this decision boundary is linear, and this decision boundary is nonlinear. Then the top row is going to be look at look at the background color. So here we have green versus yellowish, right? So the background color it seems that the there, there's a true linear relationship in the top in the top row, right? So if you if you focus on these uh, top row boxes, there is a true linear relationship. However, in uh, at the bottom row, there is true nonlinear relationship. Okay. So what is the takeaway? The takeaway is that if for whatever reason you know that the true relationship in the data is linear, then a linear classifier is going to do a perfect job. So this is going to be the winner. If the true relationship is nonlinear, then a nonlinear classifier, so decision trees are non-parametric, is going to do a better job, right? 
But the more important question is that, do we have the luxury to see what is the pattern in the data, to visualize it like this? And the answer is no, right? So if the, if the dimension of the data is super large, and uh, let's say we're dealing with thousands of features and we cannot see things easily as this, then we have to try, we can say, okay, let's try both of them and see which one is going to give us a better accuracy, okay? Uh, in terms of interpretability between linear uh, models and decision trees, they're both interpretable. Actually, decision trees are even more interpretable. But linear regression models, if we have the assumptions of classical linear models, we can talk about causality as well, right? So what is, uh, for example, what is the effect of, what is the marginal effect of changing variables on each other? Okay. Part three, how to prune a decision tree and what are the hyperparameters? So what is pruning a tree? So in order to understand what do we mean by pruning a tree, let's look at a classification example. Imagine we are plotting the error rates versus model complexity. In decision trees for model complexity, we can think of the nominal, num, number of terminal nodes, right? The more terminal nodes, it means that the tree is bushier and it's more complex. So here we are going to have a smaller tree, small tree, and here we are going to have a very bushy tree. Okay. Now, what if we have a small tree? For a smaller tree with fewer splits may lead to a lower variance, right? So look at that, the variance is low. And a better interpretation, let's say you have a tree like this, and then maybe tree only with uh, three terminal nodes, right? This is perfectly interpretable, right? It's really easy to interpret, interpretable. Uh, but it comes at the cost of high bias, right? So if you look at that, because the model is uh, least complex, it's very simple, it's going to be biased. The model bias is going to be high, right? Smaller trees are also too short-sighted. So I'm quoting from ISLR textbook, and it says that a seemingly, a seemingly worthless split early on in the tree might be followed by a very good split down the road. A split that leads to a large reduction in RSS or inferiority index later on. But if we stick to a smaller tree, that split is not going to show up, right? So that, uh, that seemingly worthless split is not going to be picked at the very, uh, let's say, top root. And for that reason, the following very good split also we're going to miss that, right? So what's the solution? It seems that maybe a better strategy is to grow a very large tree. So let's say do something like this. This may produce a good prediction on the train set. However, it is likely to overfit the data, right? And that leads to a poor test set, test set performance. So we know that if the tree is very bushy, yes, maybe the bias is small, yeah, but the, the variance is going to be large in the test set. And overall, the total error is going to be large. So, what, so for that reason, we need to do something about it. So we say that, okay, let's start with a very large tree. Let's make sure that we're going to see all these good splits down the road. We're not going to ignore any of them, but uh, we need to prune it back in order to obtain a soft tree. So we start here, we start from this bushy tree, and we're going to prune it back to get to a better uh, bias variant trade-off, right? So maybe here. All right, and for that, we're going to use a method called cost complexity pruning method. Uh, in the next slide, uh, let's talk about this method. So what is cost complexity pruning method? We also call it weakest link pruning, by the way. So this is a technique used to deal with overfitting. It reduces the size of a decision tree by removing section of the tree that are considered the weakest link, right? The, those sections provide little predictive or classification power. So in order to understand that, let's consider a sequence of trees indexed by a non-negative tuning parameter alpha. Okay, so this is our tuning parameter. Then for each value of alpha, there's going to be a corresponding subtree. So let's call it G, which is a subset of the, the, the bushiest tree, right? This is a very large tree, we call it T0. And uh, such that the following objective function is minimized. So what is the objective function? This is what we are trying to minimize in this modification. If you pay attention, the first part of the minimization is exactly what we have seen before. We are minimizing the RSS over all the regions, right? So we are minimizing the RSS in all the regions. However, we are adding the penalty term. This is pretty much like the regularization concept that we have seen before, right? 
So if you're adding a penalty term by basically saying if the tree is bushier, so this um, tree is going to be larger, then we're going to add it to the cost function. And later on, so let's go ahead and penalize it by parameter alpha, right? So what does this mean? Let, let's quickly go over the parameters first. So T indicates the number of terminal nodes in the tree. R M is the uh, region or the rectangle corresponding to Mth terminal node. And Y hat R M is the mean of the training observations in R M. So this is for a regression setup for classification. The idea is pretty much the same, okay? Cost complexity means basically penalizing the complex model, penalizing the bushy tree. And we're going to do that by adding this part to the minimization um, problem. So alpha is going to control the bias variance straight up here for us and, it's de and itself is determined by cross validation. Okay, so if you remember, this was the bias versus variance chart, you know, error rate and versus com model complexity. So bias square here, and we have overall error rate, right? Then if the tree is bushy, we know that overall error is going to be high, so we're trying to prune it back. And the idea is that add a little bit of bias in order to decrease the variance a lot, right? So that's, that's the main idea of the cost complexity pruning method. After cross-validation, when we found the alpha, we are going to go back to the data sets and uh, find the subtree corresponding to that alpha. Because remember, each alpha has a corresponding tree. So when, you, when we find the alpha, we go back to the tree and look at that optimal tree. So let's say the optimal tree has uh, T of alpha terminal nodes. So if alpha is small, uh, we are going to get LO for bushier tree. And in, the extreme, in its extreme case, uh, if alpha is zero and we are not adding any stopping criteria, then this RSS is going to converge to zero. Okay? And we're going to get the bushiest tree. As we increase the alpha, we are penalizing the complexity of the model. So basically we are forcing the model to come up with the smaller trees. Okay? And uh, by finding the optimal value for alpha, we can get a better trade-off between the bias and variance. So this method is called cost complexity pruning method. Now let's apply this cost complexity pruning method to our baseball uh, player salary example. This is the example that we are uh, borrowing from the ISLR textbook. Okay, so imagine this is the unpruned tree that results from recursive binary splitting on the train data. So this is unpruned. However, we are going to impose some stopping criteria because if there is no stopping criteria, we know that in the train set, the tree is going to be very bushy and it's going to overfit. So in this example, the stopping criteria is that we should have, uh, well, each terminal load should uh, not contain less than 10 operations. So we need to make sure that at each terminal load, there is no less than 10 observations. So we know that uh, there is no less than 10 observation here, 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 and etc. right? So how many terminal loads do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So the number of terminal loads for an unpruned tree is equal to 12. How many levels do we have? So if I want to look at the levels, so the depth of the tree, so let's look at the longest path. So here on the right hand side, one, two, three, and four, right? So the depth of the tree is four. This means that we can have potentially two to the power of four or 16 terminal nodes. But we end up with 12 terminal nodes. It means that there's a stopping criteria going on. And we talked about that stopping criteria. Now let's impose the cost complexity pruning method and look at the results. So in order to find the optimal alpha out of cost complexity method, we can plot uh, in this example, because it's regression, we're gonna look at mean squared error versus uh, tree size. Basically we can plot it against alpha, because, but we know that there is a corresponding tree to each alpha. So in the ISLR textbook, the authors prefer to plot it against tree size, but usually we can uh, plot, plot the mean squared error or the error rates versus alpha, right? And here, we're gonna look at uh, three curves. Basically, 
the, the training, the cross validation, and test set. So we're going to plot the mean squared error in the train set, cross validated version of the mean and squared error, and the test set. And we know that if you have watched my previous videos, you know that uh, for tuning the hyperparameters, it is best to work with the cross validation version, right? So the graph that we need to look into to figure out what is the best uh, optimal value for alpha is going to be this green one, the cross validated version of the MSE. If you pay attention to this one, so where is this uh, curve minimized? So right here, right? And at this point, the tree size is equal to three, right? And now let's visualize this tree in the next slide. Okay, so this is the tree that we started the, uh, this lecture with, right? So we said that in the visually, if you remember the color coded uh, circles here, visually we were satisfied with all the observations here and on the right hand side, we decided to make another split, right? And now using the cost complexity pruning method, we came up with the same answer, right? So that's how effectively this uh, cost complexity pruning technique is going to help us to come up with the optimal, al uh, optimal alpha and the correspond correspondingly to the optimal decision tree. So this is going to be the result, the final uh, optimal tree for this uh, regression problem, a tree with uh, three terminal nodes and two levels. So as you can see, this cost complexity pruning method is a very effective way to make sure that uh, we avoid overfitting, right? So what are the other hyperparameters to, uh, that help us to avoid overfitting? So other hyperparameters that we can also call them regularization parameters that helps us avoid overfitting are the following ones. The first one is the maximum depth of the tree. So if we basically tell the algorithm that you cannot have a tree with more than depth of three or four, you're basically skipping that tree relatively simple or small. And you know that a smaller tree or relatively small tree will not overfit the data, right? Another hyperparameter is minimum population at a node, right? So for example, you want to say that at each term, at each node, uh, internal node or terminal node, we, know, we want to have at least this amount of minimum uh, population or minimum train size. We can also look at maximum number of decision nodes. So let's say we're going to impose this restriction that your tree is going to have at most 10 decision nodes, right? So any of these uh, hyperparameters, as you can uh, see, is going to regularize uh, the model. Basically, by regularization means that it doesn't let it to be unnecessarily complex, okay? Another one is minimum impurity decrease, right? Or the minimum information gain we need to have, right? So this basically means that if uh, the split that you're thinking about uh, is not adding enough or large enough impurity uh, decrease to the uh, to the model, then you have to basically stop there, right? So we need to make sure that at each split that you're considering, uh, that split is going to bring enough, large enough impurity decrease or purity increase, right? So this is another one. And all, uh, finally, the one that we already talked about is our alpha. Alpha coming from the weakest link pruning or cost complexity pruning method. Okay, so what are other hyperparameters? Uh, the other ones are basically we have already talked about them. So we can think of criterion, so Gini or entropy. For regression, we usually use RSS and basically RSS is pretty much, the, the effect is pretty much the same as MSC. It really doesn't matter which one to work, to work with. And so basically, whenever we have, we are going to have a uh, the choice when it comes to a classification tree, right? Then uh, what is the splitter? So the splitter is also a hyperparameter that basically define if you want to put that uh, cutoff, and you want to select it randomly, or it it's, wants to come out of the optimization problem, right? And then finally, we can for classification, we can think of class weight, and the class weight can be either balanced or we cannot assign any kind of class weight, right? This class weight is going to basically use the value of your target variable, variable to be automatically adjusted weights inversely proportional to the class frequency, right? So for example, you have, uh, I don't know, the data set is very imbalanced, and that's that's usually the case in finance examples, right? So imagine you're looking at default versus no default of a loan application, right? Or a credit card. 
So we know that these data sets are usually, for example, 97%, 98%, no default, and uh, let's say 1 to 2% or 2 to 3% default, right? So these are highly, highly, highly imbalanced. And for imbalanced data, we know that we have to do something about it, right? Because we cannot trust uh, the performance metrics like, you know, AUC or, you know, or ROC, right? And for that, we can change the class weight of the model uh, from non to balanced. Basically, we are going to give these observations a weight inversely related to their frequency. All right. Now, part four, pros and cons of decision trees. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? Let's start with the prod. So the first one is there are decision trees are very easy to interpret and visualize, especially if the size of the tree is relatively small. So in the previous example, both for regression and classification, we ended up with trees that are uh, relatively small and we saw that they are perfectly interpretable and it was easy to visualize them. So this is going to be a very important advantage of decision trees in general because if we care about interpretability of the models this is these are one of the best models out there the next uh, advantage is going to be this one the decision trees can easily handle categorical data without the need to create dummy variable so this is going to become very very useful and important so let me give you an example imagine you're looking at a regression problem you're trying to uh, predict what is going to be the price of the house, right? So, and your data is zip level data, zip code level data. So imagine this variable that you have in the data, it's zip code, and you're going to have 40 zip codes uh, data, right? And then you're trying to predict what is the price of the house based on some other features, right? So, you know, square feet, number of bedrooms, and et cetera. So if you want to think of this zip code, if you want to add, you want to add the zip codes in, in the feature space, you have to uh, make it as a dummy variable because with the models that we have covered so far, there is no way to interpret that or actually to even think about the zip code if you don't make it as a dummy variable, right? So, but however, for a regression, for a decision trees, we don't need to necessarily change it to dummy variable, right? So for example, we can have a decision node or internal node and the splits are going to be zip code, zip code number one, zip code number two, zip code number three, and et cetera, right? So we're gonna end up with one categorical variable, which is zip, right? So in this very simple example, if uh, we want to, let's say we have x1, x2, and x3, these are the features. If uh, we wanna work with a categorical variable, and uh, we are gonna end up with, let's say four features, zip, x1, x2, x3. But if we have to create the dummy variable for categorical variables, we're gonna end up with, let's say, 40. Uh, let's keep all of them in the model. We don't need to drop one of them. So let's keep the 40 in the model. So we're gonna end up with 43 features. So there's a huge difference between the two, right? So one model is dealing with four features, the other one, 43 features. And that's usually the case for in many applications out there. So usually if you want to use any model uh, rather than random forest or tree-based models in general, maybe you're going to end up with hundreds of features, but with a tree-based model, you're going to end up with a lot smaller and manageable number of features. So this is also a big advantage of decision trees. The next one is decision trees can easily capture nonlinear patterns. So in the data set that we saw already for baseball and player salary or for the classification, the data was nonlinear, right? So we had a box like this and you come up with a split and then there was another split here. So this is capturing the nonlinearity in the pa in non -linearity pattern in the data, right? So by, so for example, we had, I don't know, we had years and number of hits here will be started with uh, years and then went down the tree. And this, uh, for example, here we had number of hits and et cetera. We can go down the tree, we can make more splits based on, again, again based on years or later on, again, based on hits. So as you can see, this nonlinearity is captured, is easily captured by decision trees. And this is also another advantage. 
another one is going to be the case that we know decision trees can handle data in its raw form. We don't even need to pre-process the data. And by pre-processing here, basically I mean maybe scaling the data, you know, feature scaling, standardization, normalization. And why? Because we do need to scale the features whenever we are calculating some sort of distance between observations, right? So for example, in KNN or in SVM, because we were doing, we were calculating the distance from observations, we had to pre-process the data. We had to scale the features. But for uh, decision trees, you know, we are not calculating any distance between observations. So we can, so that model can easily handle the data in its raw form. However, we know that if we pre-process the data even for decision trees, it's not, it's not going to hurt. And finally, decision trees are non-parametric model. This means that we are not imposing any functional form or any assumption about making any assumption about the distribution of the features, right? Uh, so because simply the model is non-parametric. This, the fact that decision trees are non-parametrics can, uh, can be thought of as they are flexible. And uh, at, this, at some point, if you are not putting any stopping criteria, they can overfit. So that's going to be one of the disadvantages that we're going to talk about. But just remember, these are non-parametric. It means that they're flexible and they can capture complex pattern in the data. So what are the disadvantages? So the main disadvantage of decision trees is that it's poor level of predictive accuracy. And that's that's the caveat of these models. So we really like all these advantages of decision trees, right? So we know that they are very useful. However, this the poor level of accuracy or predictive power is going to make us wonder what can we do about it, okay? So we have to extend the idea of decision trees. So let's see how we can do that. So that's the topic for future episodes, right? What are other disadvantages? The decision trees are sensitive to noisy data, right? They can overfit noisy data. It means that a small variation in the, in the data can result in a different decision tree. We can fix that. You know, this can be reduced by bagging and boosting algorithm, which we are going to talk about the details in the next module. All right, this concludes our module number nine, classification and regression trees. I completely know that, that this was a very lengthy uh, theory lecture, but just bear with me because without understanding all these details, we cannot demystify one of the most powerful machine learning models out there for structured data, which is XGBoost. So XGBoost is a bunch of these trees, and then we basically need to understand all the details of decision trees first to make sure we can demystify that concept. So just hang in there until the next one. Take care.